Yeah, the prayers. Okay, we're gonna start at seven line. You want to do that this morning? Okay. <clears throat> Oh, Lord, you 
Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for my voice this morning. Let's uh, hopefully <clears throat> prayers will go a little bit better. Hope everybody can hear me okay online for sure. And we'll start with uh, praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. I'll keep these away from the mic too, actually. Uh, teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, holy and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be attained, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, holy and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be attained, Supreme One, Teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, O Destroyer, Glorious Victorious One, Shakyamuni, do I may homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, O Destroyer, thus gone, holy and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, Teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, Supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, feel devotion like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. For from freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds, 
look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the guru. In the Dharma, in the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. <clears throat> Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam guru ratna mandala kam nir tiyami. And the heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra. I prostrate to the Arya triple gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on mass of vultures mountain on Rajariya together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through their power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the venerable Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, emptiness is not other than form, Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling discrimination, compositional factors in consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental unconsciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. 
there is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond air, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared Hayata Gate Gate Paragate Parsam Gate Bodhiso. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the venerable Sharidavi Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the worlds of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Thank you, everybody. request to turn the wheel of dharma do you want me to say in tibetan or english uh we'll do english okay to fulfill the needs of all beings at their various levels of understanding we request that you turn the wheel of dharma including the lesser and greater common and extraordinary approaches apologies sorry Joe, can you hear me? One in the dojo, one here is $500, so let's use it, right? So, mm -hmm. oh. I'm hopefully far enough away, so I'm speaking softly with amplification, so by the time a droplet <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> it drops, maybe plunk that way. So thank you for being here and masking up and um, being vaccinated and being safe. Um, you know, it's probably going to be a long haul, right? You know. <clears throat> Vajrayana Buddhism uh, is is a real. Uh, um, we, we, we want to do everything. We want to learn everything. So we practice all the vehicles, right? <clears throat> all the yanas, so to speak. We, we want to like just make everything possible. So sometimes we say the individual liberation path is um, not harming others. Or as um, Karen Magella, one of the uh, psychologists at Naropa used to say, I just don't be a nuisance. <laughs> to be tidy, you know, be, don't be a nuisance. And uh, 
in uh, Mahayana vehicle, then we're practicing the Paramita Yana, the uh, ethical systems leading to uh, wisdom. And in Vajrayana, uh, we're also getting a little feedback, so not, not a problem. I'm working on it. Okay. Then uh, we're uh, practicing the Yanas of energy uh, and love, right? So, but we don't drop off the other vehicles. We're still practicing uh, uh, the liberation precepts not to harm oneself and others. Uh, we're practicing um, all the paramitas, starting with generosity up to wisdom, and all the precepts that go with that, bodhicitta. And then we're practicing the tantra vehicle of uh, Buddhahood in one lifetime and uh, developing the energy and powers and finally uh, this this filled wisdom love, right? <laughs> we, we need to know the truth and we need love and to be in love. <clears throat> so Tantrianas, uh, Bajanas are people that want it all, um, but there is a discipline that goes with it. You, can have it all, but it has to be um, in a, a stage. It has to be uh, uh, in some kind of uh, necessary uh, uh, way to digest it, right? So um, one of my teachers liked to talk about food, <laughs> which I do too. So he uh, spent some time with Bujum Rimshe in France. So he said, you know, uh, you, you start with an appetizer, and uh, this is in America, you start with a salad first, right? But then France, it comes later, and then in between each meal, you might have some little minty thing or something to uh, refresh your palate, right? And you're not just stuffing your face. Uh, <laughs> so it's, if you've got to dinner, in France, you know, it could easily be a four hour situation, right? You know, so because we have to digest things uh, at the right speed so we don't get bloated or sick. And we want to taste the food, right? And we want to enjoy the company. So if you eat, you just have your food like this, you're not uh, enjoying the company. So Vajan is very much based on that idea that um, things uh, work best when we. Uh, you know, consider the rhythm and the delivery like that. Um, so uh, that's a big part of the path and uh, what's uh, sometimes called the hierarchy. Um, hierarchy in Vajrayana is not like a top-down hierarchy, like military or even political. It's the hierarchy of uh, when is the proper time to deliver um, uh, you know, dolce, the dessert, and when is the proper time to deliver the entree, right? Uh, also, appreciate like my surroundings and, and um, good wait staff, you know. So, France is a little bit, um, actually, I like France. I don't know, people said they're nice, nice, and I go, well, yes, they are. I mean, growing up in New York, I don't expect people to say, Hi, I'm your server for tonight. You know, it's like, they don't do that. <laughs> so in Vajrayana too, sometimes you know, we're a little formal, but that's because we want you to enjoy the meal. Uh, we don't want to make it about us, right? So you don't have to, you know, we're, we're like good attendants, we're, we're there, but we're not intrusive, hopefully. So. The structure of the form of doing a service is so you can hear as much as you can hear without being disturbed like that. So today we're going to talk about um, the 12 links of dependent origination, uh, talking about bhava uh, becoming um, uh, sipa, and uh, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. You know. I'm going to have American pronunciation of Tibetan anyway. <clears throat> Uh, the Buddha and Lama Tsongkhapa in particular emphasized that uh, the insight, the wisdom, 
that uh, really gained and that uh, we hope to gain as the insight into uh, Pratichya Samatpada uh, interdependent origination. <clears throat> so the person that sees interdependent origination sees the Buddha, the person that sees the Buddha sees interdependent origination. But uh, it's expressed in many different ways. So the 12 links that we've been looking at uh, is expressing uh, interdependence uh, from the stand standpoint of uh, uh, actually samsara. So uh, not from the aspect of uh, liberation. Uh, we have to reverse the process to have liberation. Sometimes we talk about uh, interdependence from the standpoint like uh, of this is the way really things are, the liberated state, right? Um, but the 12 links is talking about how uh, we're stuck from lifetime to lifetime. So you find in Dharma uh, two operating uh, pedagogies. One is how things are. Let's talk about how things are or how things must be. And then let's talk about how things got screwed up and how to uh, untie the knots. So, so one, one way is how things must be uh, completely uh, open and free, but then why don't we always experience things as being open, free, and loving, and sane? <laughs> uh, so the Buddha tried to provide teachings for both. <clears throat> so uh, the 12 links aspect uh, that we've been going through is depicted uh, graphically as a uh, uh, the wheel of life and traditionally uh, there's one right over the entrance uh, in this case it's exit but uh, we have the wheel of life tanka with um, yama uh, lord of death uh, holding it in one's grip like that and has the six realms and around it uh, symbolic pictures of the 12 madonnas the 12 links <clears throat> and at its core there's, uh, you know, ignorance and uh, greed and uh, hostility, right? So uh, that, that's a pictorial representation of uh, why things are messed up and how things are messed up. <clears throat> so the Buddha tried to give uh, teachings on how things actually are when they're not messed up not in samsara, and then how things are in samsara and how they got that way and how to get out the path aspect. So the 12 links is generally um, on the standpoint of relative truth or the path, path aspect. <clears throat> From a, a teaching point of view, uh, I think one of the points that to review the links is to really get clear that unless we develop uh, uh, some renunciation of our habitual patterns of uh, samsara and develop a strong uh, desire to be free and help others be free through bodhicitta, we'll, we'll be stuck in an endless pattern. So it, it's very much tries to hammer home like, well, uh, this is how those patterns work. And if nothing changes, nothing changes in the pattern. We'll keep doing it from one lifetime to the next. <clears throat> um, there's a debate in Western Buddhism. Stephen Batcher is probably the main proponent um, for a secular Buddhism. Uh, says, well, you don't, you don't have to um, uh, believe in uh, succession lives or, or rebirth. Um, <clears throat> to practice dharma. I think that's true, actually, from that point of view. Like, we shouldn't believe anything absolutely until we verified it for ourselves, right? <clears throat> um, but uh, it's part of the assumed wisdom, so to speak, of uh, all the yogis, not just Buddhist, uh, definitely coming out of Asia. In a famous discussion with Bob Thurman, uh, Bob was pointing to Sorry, I call him Bob. I should say <laughs> Dr. Thurman. It's not like a buddy, but okay. I met him. All right. So, uh, 
He's not busy, he'd be okay. Sorry, bro. Um, he was pointing to the tantric idea of that uh, when we look closely at the nature mind, we see that is continuous, right? That uh, a mind uh, moment does not arise from a materialistic uh, uh, epiphenomena like this mind coming from brain. Uh, it only arises from a previous mind moment. And likewise, in deep reflection, we said the, the mind moment um, uh, gives rise to the next mind moment. So uh, this is very profound, you know, uh, which means that uh, the nature of awareness and uh, our life actually is, is an ongoing, um, sometimes tr translated as mind stream. But, uh, this is difficult to verify um, uh, in one's personal experience without doing the necessary study and the special meditations, right? It doesn't make sense to ordinary consciousness, but uh, you know, atoms and quarks don't make sense to ordinary consciousness. It's special electron. more convinced of the uh, continuous arising of uh, ignorance, right? <laughs> so that's what uh, the Buddha is trying to point out in the 12 links, that uh, our, our suffering arises through causes and conditions uh, and, and can be eliminated through proper causes and conditions, but without making a change in our uh, patterns, uh, nothing will change. So I'm fond of saying in uh, recovery language that there's no spring at the bottom. You know, we talk about hitting a bottom, your bottom, and then, then you say, I don't want to do this anymore. The bottom's like your bottom line, like, I don't want to end up, you know, another DUI again. So that's your bottom. But uh, we all want a soft bottom, right? Like that. <clears throat> Um, the Buddha said, okay, uh, I, I'm going to give you these teachings so that you realize that without making a change, without the necessary effort, um, things will just continue. I like pointing out to students, uh, particularly that come in Darshan, um, that, uh, you know, for me, uh, uh, the Buddha's teachings on uh, right effort sometimes um, translated as a diligence. I like that word diligence, you know, um, are emphasized the most next to wisdom and love, of course, but on the path aspect, diligence. So the right effort, uh, uh, diligence is mentioned as part of the uh, Astamarga, the Eightfold Path, right? Diligence or joyful effort sometimes turns out like that term too. Joyful effort sounds like a oxymoronic statement sometimes, but that, that also that's uh, one of the paramitas. And um, we're quite sure that uh, the Buddha's last words contain the word effort, right? Any doubts there? I have no doubts. Like heard by so many people. So, uh, Practice diligently, right? Right. So all 
you know, composite phenomena are impermanent, practice diligently. Like, it didn't say, hey, don't worry, be happy. That would have been nice. <laughs> Meher Baba is like one of my college heroes. Like, when I was taking tests, look at a poster of Meher Baba. I'm like, don't worry, be happy. Okay, I can pass the statistics test. Yes, I do that. So uh, the diligent aspect um, is necessary to overcome uh, and break the links, so to speak. But the way um, uh, he actually practiced this is under uh, the Bodhi tree, uh, the sacred fig tree. He uh, went back and forth on this kind of 12 uh, link system, like seeing how to rose and then seeing how to undo it. So uh, becoming the bhava um, after grasping means uh, technically that uh, uh, the grasping creates even more uh, strong karma, strong action, that you're, you're just going to be like thrown into, um, you know, old age and thrown into uh, death and thrown into birth, you know, it's like it's extremely strong. There's a karma created even early on, right? We've talked about that. Like very, very quickly, we noticed that uh, uh, mind, relative mind is, is intentional, right? It's not the blank slate. It has energy and intention to it, but uh, it is accelerated, uh, you know, when there is grasping. So there's, there's, uh, there's a desire, the thirst, and then there's the grasping that I talked about a couple of weeks ago. And from that, um, uh, there's a strong becoming. So <clears throat> the uh, becoming, sometimes it, it's a little bit uh, probably needs to be uh, revised. I don't know. We could have a discussion. Uh, a lot of times the, the becoming in the real life, sometimes it's uh, a uh, couple having intercourse, sometimes a pregnant woman, right? Should we change that? I don't know. We have discussion. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's pretty, you know, it's like once, you know, there's this way to reverse pregnancy, but then, then something's going to happen, right? I don't know. Would becoming being uh, like, what do you think, making love? <laughs> Is it like, what, is it more accurate to say it's like you know something's going to happen as a result of sex, or or is it like it's the becoming the child? You know, they're they're both pretty strong, right? So um, we could use other metaphors. Maybe you know we shouldn't use um, women's bodies or something like for metaphors. I don't know, but there's there are other metaphors in the yellow life like. A guy with an arrow in his eye, right? <laughs> so, <clears throat> or a monkey looking, you know, trying to look out of the window of the senses. That monkey mind, we hear that a lot, right? So the becoming is like, it's so strong that it's like uh, the, the arrows uh, left, right? <clears throat> so uh, it's left the bow. Um, then it's really hard to uh, change that karma, right? The Buddhists are not um, omnipotent. We, most of us grow up either accepting or rejecting some omnipotent being, right? God, could, Judeo Christian religions generally are going to say that there's a being that can intervene and in cause and effect, intervene in history, intervene and, you know, part the waters or do that stuff, right? Um, can the Buddhists do that? The Buddhists can do miracles, which have a certain, um, uh, because a certain knowledge of the phenomenal world, but um, can they change someone's karma once, once you're on that What's the no? That's why um, there's a big emphasis. You know, traditional teachers will 
hammer away at the six realms. Like, don't think you can change. You can change the karma at that point. It's it's going to happen. You're, you're going to have to live with that. You know, the kind of thing. Uh, There's mitigating karma, right? So you create. That's how we get out of it, or we be screwed, right? So you create other causes and conditions. You know, you said, okay, this this has happened. I've had my train wreck, and here's how I deal with it. So it doesn't mean like we're, it's hopeless. It's just that we've created a strong becoming, then it's probably going to become. Right? And then, you know, maybe we're involved in cleanup. We have to create new karmas. So the bhava is an extremely important part that um, on a practice level, not just a description of how things are or a warning, um, it's part of our inner uh, practice. Uh, we could be asking, like, what, what am I becoming right now? Usually, um, essentialist philosophies uh, and Buddhism has some essentialist aspects. We'll say, well, who am I, right? It's very big. Identity things are even stronger today than they were in the past, right? Who are you? you know? uh, we usually say, I'm this or I'm that. But, uh, from the inner practice point of view, the inner path would be, what are we becoming? What are, who are we becoming? Not like, I'm this, and I wish it was this. You know, I'm fat, and I wish it was thin. <laughs> I'm smart, and I wish I was stupid. No, we don't wish to do this. <laughs> so, but who are we becoming? So, uh, in a way, looking at the uh, 12 links, of course, is to reverse them, right? To go all the way back to the ignorance, uh, what, uh, which I think is a good approach, you know, very uh, stage theory, like um, your dinner in France. Um, but another way is from uh, Mahamudra Dzogchen perspective is also to see like each of the links has a clue uh, to its own liberation, right? Each one has its own uh, emptiness, its own purity, its own release valve. So when we bring wisdom to becoming, ask the question of ourselves, who am I becoming? What is becoming here? Uh, then uh, we bring a wisdom mind to that link, you see? And the energy of that link combined with the wisdom mind can liberate it, right? <clears throat> instead of being on a fixated like who have I become or what am I right now but uh, from a dynamic process point of view who am I becoming so I'd like to uh, stop here um, uh, hopefully some people found useful um, I like questions and comments and complaints so I, I think we have to pass around the microphone now to uh, um, so I have a question. Oh, wait, did I? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lama, for your yeah. teaching. Question about the concept of intercession and miracles. Yeah. So when you were talking, the first thing that came to mind was doing something like a Vajrasattva purification. Yeah. And when we asked for uh, purification of karma, Right? And yeah. the, the concept of Vajrasattva, right? Right. So could you help me understand, in my mind, that's intercessionary, but it might be because I have a template for that. When I do something like a, a purification practice, am I putting my motivation and karma towards asking for the practice and mm -hmm. asking for the, like the miracle to be bestowed upon me? Mm -hmm. Or is that an intercessionary quality of that Buddha. That's where I'm trying to kind of conceptualize that better. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think everyone could, could hear Sasha, right? Yeah, good. Um, very strong characteristic of Vajrayana is um, um, imagination, right? Some uh, 
some American schools of Buddhism, like no imagination, just wash the dishes, please. <laughs> just chop some carrots. You know, um, it's very imaginative. Uses the power of uh, imagination uh, because imagination can really get us in trouble. So let's learn how to use it, right? Um, uh, a big part of, uh, I would say, human psyche is to uh, project our qualities outward. So we're using that um, projective quality of human beings, which is usually misunderstood uh, and misused, to uh, effectively work with ourselves. So we are protecting our, our Buddha nature in Sattva. And it's temporarily looks like outside being looks different than, than this, right? Um, so we're the ones that are ultimately, you know, um, uh, you know, starting a new karmic path, right? So when we say purify karma, we, we really mean we're, we're making a fresh start, not that we can just kind of wipe it out. I know the texts talk like that, you know, because the emphasis is trying to be like, um, okay, make a fresh start, you know, let's, let's not ruminate, let's not perseverate on, uh, you know, this, you know, because we say to ourselves all the time, like, oh, God, I'm so stupid, why did I do that? And we go around, you know, we go to others and we talk to them and they go, you know, you told me that you did that a million times, and I, I know, you, you know, it's like that. So we say, you know, like, okay, we're just going to imagine that you're making a totally fresh start. So the totally fresh start is we're making a totally new start, but um, we're not going to, uh, you know, reverse past karmas. So, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of training and practice, you know, uh, uh, during the AIDS um, epidemic. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of silliness going around about miracle cures, right? So fortunately, you know, I had good teachers. Um, I said, you know, like, this, you know, we, we want to get a cure. We want to, you know, quickly as possible. We want to tell the truth. Buddhists are generally trying to tell the truth. But um, this was like, you know, in the 80s, like, there's no protector practice or no I just have a practice if you, you know, have full blown, that's it, right? Let's, you know, doing prayers for people, but uh, don't pretend, right? Like, and there's no magical, there's not a magical thing for COVID either, right? But uh, by enhancing or, of course, starting new karmas like living healthy, enhancing our immune system psychologically, spiritually will help, but, um, you know, there's a lot of religious idiots, right? And like, God will, <laughs> won't allow me to get, you know, a disease or something. And um, we don't believe that, you know. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I like, uh, I do like miracles, frankly. So, and uh, like, okay, I mean, I could be totally behind, you know, Jesus raised Lazarus, right? I could get behind that. But of course, Lazarus died again, right? Human being, so that's karma. So we could demonstrate, okay, something, but still, then you, that's that's Buddhist idea. People get, <laughs> sometimes people get upset when we say that, like, yeah, that was wonderful, but of course, Lazarus died again, right? <laughs> <laughs> Also, I don't know, you know, maybe Lazarus didn't have a say, you know, it's like, right? So we Buddhists ask first, do you want me to, do you want me to cure you? We're not automatically going to go in and, right? Uh, for those who have done chaplaincy in hospitals, um, uh, we're very polite, you know, Susan knows, who's very polite, like, um, I'm here, but I can leave if you need me to, and, uh, would, would you like me to well, let me do something on your behalf or what do you need, right? We don't just go in and slam someone, right? So, but it's sort of like that, you know, because we know that someone's karma 
the way they deal with things has already, in many ways, the arrow has already left the bow, correct? Yeah. Maybe that's too much. No. Thank you. Thank you, Lama. Can you hear me? There we go. Um, so I want to kind of piggyback on that question, and, and you, you kind of brought up a metaphor of addiction, and I started thinking of it, how someone with, let's say, an alcohol addiction um, may say, you know, I've relapsed, and this means that I'm just a hopeless alcoholic, mm -hmm. and there's no hope for me, and I might as well just accept my fate, right? That's a becoming, but then the purification practice there would be there were causes and conditions that led to this relapse. Uh, you have to accept the karma of that, uh, but also recognize what the causes and conditions were and work to purify them by not going back to the bar and trying to drink club soda. Is, is it kind of like that? Is that a good metaphor? Yeah, basically, I, I think, you know, Buddha Dharma is kind of a little bit of an addiction, you know, program. So uh, we, we do have the capabilities as human beings to have a fresh start. So particularly in Mahayana and Tantra, we're emphasizing um, that there's, there's an ongoing uh, process um, uh, that we classify very broadly as Buddha nature, which are these uh, liberating, enlightening qualities that even though they could be covered over, uh, can't be destroyed. So um, we do need the right cause and conditions, though, to activate those and recognize them, right? So that's the sad part. A lot of times people don't come into contact with um, good teachers or good sponsors or good therapists, and, and um, you know, they're not able on their own to bring it about, right? But uh, we're basically an optimistic group of yogis can say, well, we, we always have the potential to do that. It's not hopeless, but uh, for something to change, something has to change like that. We generally have to stop one thing and start something new. So lots of times when we say purification, we mean just stopping. Yeah, so, like that. You gotta stop and then make a fresh start. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I think a big part of our practice about that is we, you know, as we're renouncing that, we also say we're not going to do it again. That's really important, right? We have to make a resolution, <laughs> you know. So it, it does make a difference to create um, resolutions, which sometimes do, do take a long time to stick. That doesn't mean they're not important to do. Um, like that, you know, but um, every once in a while I um, re watch the, the segment from the New Heart show, Stop It. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? Yeah, Stop It. S T O P. <laughs> New word, I P. Yeah, like that. So it, it is a karmic mystery. Um, that actually we don't try to explain, um, like wh why sometimes people seem to have the capacity to uh, make a fresh start and others don't. Um, and some philosophies and religious systems they really try to explain that, and I think it just you know like a theodicy explaining the um, ways of God to man, so to speak. Um, I, I, Buddha Dharma, we, we really don't try to do that. We know there have to be causes and conditions, but uh, the Buddha actually chided uh, Ananda as attendant because Ananda came back from a retreat and says, hey, I, I nailed, I, I got karma nailed. <laughs> Which means that, you know, he was saying, I, I was able to discern all the causes and conditions, um, but that's very difficult. It's a thing that we're, we wrestle with all the time in the health field or legal field or kids like, okay, is, is it their fault or is it my fault? You know, or 
you know, what, uh, how much blame should others take, or is it nurture nature, you know, like that. Very difficult, right? So we can come back to uh, their, their, whether things are uh, ongoing mind stream flow, like Buddha nature, or things are, sometimes we use the term adventitious, like you know, sort of that Buddha nature um, translation, uh, whether they're absolute or relative, uh, uh, whether, you know, you say uh, those kind of words, you're, to affect a change, we're going to need causes and conditions. So we, in our tradition, but it's true, <laughs> we don't really believe in spontaneous enlightenment. You know, you know, you know. As well, you know, somebody ran into some teaching somewhere, somebody did some practice somewhere, you know, it isn't just, um, you know, the Buddha practice, Padmasambhava practice, Yeshi Sangha practice, Tara practices, right? Even the Bodhisattvas have to practice. Right? You know the story of Tara, right? So, you know, princess had to practice. <clears throat> that be helpful? Alala. Yeah, I don't. I don't have my. Uh, uh, I don't have a, a tablet in front of me now, so I don't know who's waving their hand wildly, so or not. <clears throat> Are there some? Uh, how can we read the chats? <laughs> Mostly about audio and Dirk had a comment, but you should probably read it because it's not English. So there are no chats. Cool. Let's There's get no this question. to Susan. Susan wants certain comment here. Okay. Am I on? Yeah. Okay. On. You know, um, when you were talking about causes and conditions. The thing that for me is really hard is that the causes and conditions are infinite. <clears throat> and, and, you know, to say, okay, um, I need to start again. I need to make a new direction. And these are the conditions that I have some control over and can change in order to change that trajectory. Mm -hmm. But there are so many other influences. Mm -hmm. There's so much interdependence, you know, that it's sometimes what, what can you do to maintain momentum, to mm -hmm. maintain faith that changing 20 conditions, 10 conditions is actually going to change the trajectory when indeed there are billions out there that you have no control over. A lot of time has been spent on that. So, um, like from the sense of uh, Buddhist philosophy, like what, what, what are primary and secondary causes, right? So there are lots of examples around, um, you have to have a primary cause like the seed, but if you don't have the secondary cause of the earth, causes earth and water and sunshine, you don't, you don't get the flower. So lots of discussion on that, which you know, is really you know, to karma, which is intentional causes. So, uh, so much of the uh, path comes down to uh, what uh, do we personally believe is our strongest cause, right? Um, uh, generally, I, I would say, uh, uh, particularly in, in Tantra, uh, which is a subset of Mahayana, bodhicitta is the, the greatest primary cause. So we're just going to hammer away on that, like bodhicitta is the beginning and the end, right? Um, but uh, 
that doesn't mean that there can't be there um, that doesn't have to also be all a bunch of secondary causes so someone can have really the wish to be free and to want to be awake and free to benefit others but um, they're they're in a place where they're under a lot of pain they're under a lot of uh, oppression they're under a lot of uh, distraction so they don't have time to settle down they don't have time to heal they don't have time to meditate you know they don't have information right so those are all secondary causes so it doesn't remove the, what achieved as being the primary cause uh, uh, but uh, we're left in kind of an uncomfortable uh, explanation in a sense though maybe the, the main Buddhist explanation is okay it may not be this lifetime right you know which is hard to hear like uh, you know so that uh, that's true for all of us right now all of us are in some ways where there's some things we're not going to get this lifetime we won't bring fruition right uh, and maybe a lot of them we don't care but um, those are harsh existential facts that even though they're primary causes, we still need the secondary causes. So that's why, um, oops, so much um, prayers or motivations that seem performative or ancient or religious or something to, to gain the positive qualities or merits. So we're constantly saying, you know, I really want to be around good friends. I really want to be around a place that's not being in war. I really don't want to have some incurable sickness. I don't really want a lot of pain. You know, I really, I need all these things not out of a sense of, of greed or something, but unless I have them, even though I have uh, primary causes of renunciation, bodhicitta, and even some insight into emptiness, I, you know, I still need to have these secondary causes. So there's a very practical sense in Dharma like that. But the, the, the causes are really kind of infinite, but they're still, uh, uh, as far as secondary causes, but there are very few primary causes. But, Could you use the microphone, please? Yeah, sorry, my bad, my bad, my bad. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. To continue the conversation, so if you have bodhicitta or are working to develop and strengthen, and you know that's your focus, that particular cause is going to have an overriding effect, if not just in this lifetime, at least in the next one and the next one. Right. If you keep okay, so so yeah. the the the. the answer answer the focus in terms of purification creating merit to break the cycle of becoming is to develop bodhicitta yes so thank you, thank you. Uh, the, there's an enormous amount of intentionality that's built into the system um, so from our Dharma point of view, we try to celebrate when people can magnetize, you know, uh, the resources. Um, but at the same time, really, we don't want to blame when the resources haven't been, been there, you know, because there's a lot of blaming that goes on, particularly when people are sick or poor or, or politically oppressed, like that happens in popular Buddhism too, right? You know, popular religion it's like well you know you must have offended god or you're a member of the elect or you must have done you know something really bad in the past lifetime or you know your face looks like a donkey because you laughed like a donkey <laughs> you know there's a lot of really crazy things um where we try to make uh, karma very mechanical um uh, and some of those are nifty and inspiring like Maybe in a past lifetime, there was an ant that was on someone's foot that circumambulated the stupa, you know. So we, we <laughs> you know, so it was reborn in a good birth or something. So um, we, ha we have to see these as teaching parables that um, even uh, a small amount of um, 
uh, aspiration of bodhicitta pays off. So my teacher was on to me and I'd say, you know, how much effort should you give? Would ask these kind of questions, you know. And I'd say, what do you think I said? Like 110%, right? You know, <laughs> you go, mm, 5%. <laughs> Because particularly in America, we get seem to get discouraged fairly easily. You know, we're nutty. Made a country in Asia, stayed there for 15 years, screwed up, leave. And we decide to, you know, many years later, 40, you know, 30 years later, made Afghanistan, stay for 20 years. Surprised nothing works out, leave. You know, it's like very little's learned, right? Um, but even with a little bodhicitta and intelligence, then uh, it, it will grow. It has a natural growth like that too. So Buddha Dharma has a very strong kind of, um, uh, a lot of strong vegetative metaphors, <laughs> like planting and cultivating. So uh, bhava and bhavana are close together word. Bhavana means cultivation. So, uh, you know, the one way to talk about meditation, uh, meditation is cultivation. So it isn't just like figuring something out or achieving a state, right? So um, one of my main teachers, Chodron Rinpoche, you know, just said, I, I'm, I'm tired of all this, like, <laughs> I'm tired of all this detail about everything. It's just, it's cultivation, guys. You cultivate it. It isn't, you know, now you have it, now you don't, or... You know, it, it, it takes, you know, it's, it's a garden metaphor, you know, like very much uh, it's a seed, but we talk about seeds, you know, and grow them and it takes weeding and, you know, so garden metaphors and growth metaphors are very strongly dharmic. But if, if we don't uh, have some we don't have a belief or aspiration if we if we really think this life is it then um sometimes that can be enormously liberating right uh for some people that's enormously liberating i can't say it isn't but for other people it's then they feel hopeless right <clears throat> uh, so in buddha dharma um uh in the buddhist time actually uh, and from the Hidayana teachings, Prana Moksha teachings, individual liberation, being reborn is a drag, right? You 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 want to get out of the cycle. You don't you don't want you don't you don't want to say oh oh great I got another chance. No, you you you're saying this life is the life. Um, but sometimes it, it's also healing to say well okay we the progress uh, karmically we've made it won't be erased. So we don't believe that, you know, it's not a eraser system. But I think it has psychological aspects. Would you rather just kind of know like, okay, this is it? Or would you rather kind of believe that there's um, also ongoing lifetimes? Yeah. yeah, so part of the Tolka system, as Greg said, is can be a confirmation that that does seem to be, uh, yeah. But of course, um, you know, like there's no Shakyamuni Tolka, right? So, like that, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some people in China have claimed, you know, it's funny, you know, like the world Buddha is now coming to Sacramento. Like that. So, we're just about out of time. But, uh, um, Lama Lek, Dirk yeah. has his hand up. Okay. Cool. That's cool. Well, you can stop. Uh, uh, Connor had asked me to say what my comment was. I was just uh, happy to, that I've studied the verb that <laughs> to become. <laughs> so, I, so I gave that. But I do have a question, uh, just a general question. Aren't we just practicing to becoming something that we're not, to become better than we are? Practicing something to becoming well, not yeah. So, uh, uh, these 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 are the two horns of the Dharma bowl, you know. So we're practicing to be not something, 
and not an idiot, and we're practicing to become a Buddha at the same simultaneously, I would say. So, uh, Suzuki Roshi, the, the Zen teacher who came to San Francisco, was quoted as saying, um, you're perfect just as you are, and you could use some improvement. <laughs> so, uh, we're, we're definitely uh, practicing on a relative level to actualize what uh, is not there presently, um, and it's only there in potential, but we're also practicing to uncover what's already there. So, uh, there are two very big metaphors or styles of path or explanations. One is a cultivation style, like it starts out as a seed, uh, and then you cultivate it through causes and conditions. It's very much stages of the path style. The other style is the immediacy teachings, particularly of Dzogchen, where um, it's on direct immediate recognition. So, um, you know, nothing is uh, um, changed or uh, it's beyond exception, accepting or rejecting, right? So those, those two uh, styles, uh, you know, where we're building things up and rejecting others on, on a long run style stages of the path um, are combined with the immediacy teachings of Mahamudra and Dzogchen. And uh, they, they don't, um, this is my opinion, okay, so they, uh, I'm not saying like ex cathedra as lama, just personal opinion. Uh, they, they don't always entirely mesh, right? <laughs> we'd, we'd like to think, okay, these, these kind of different styles, Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana, Mahamudra, they all kind of like, are just like a wonderful, um, uh, classy automatic uh, transmission system. But um, for most of us, um, not only our personal practice, but how we learn Dharma and how we have to practice is more like, um, you know, learning how to drive on a really sticky stick shift, right? Anybody here learn to drive on stick shift? There's initially some grinding noise, right? <laughs> and then, and, uh, followed by someone yelling at us. <laughs> but we want to get that driver's license, uh, or we want to take out the car, you know. So, um, of course, me being me, you know, I learned how to drive before getting the license and took the car out when people weren't looking. I'm sure, none of you have done that. But <laughs> I well, Lama, I, I learned how to drive on a tractor, but uh, <laughs> but I was being a little facetious, I guess, and didn't probably communicate it very well. That isn't it dangerous to think we're trying to become something that we're not. Uh, it is dangerous from you know an essentialist point of view because then uh, we have a very solid view of who we are and who we sh you know must be. Um, and then, you know, we, we start, you know, have a practice of kind of chasing the carrot like that. And a lot of people have that kind of practice. Um, so people come to me and say, I just can't accept me. <laughs> I can't accept myself for who I am. So I say, stop trying to be something you're not. Does that make sense? Because self-acceptance has become its own kind of horrible torture rack. <laughs> so stop trying to accept yourself. <laughs> stop it. You know, SDOP. You know. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, from uh, Madhyamaka point of view and uh, uh, from Dzogchen point of view, um, um, particularly when we combine uh, like uh, like re reading uh, Nipam Rimshe's uh, commentary on Majumaka, as I'm sure Dirk does too, uh, then uh, we see that that's actually absurd uh, to try to become something you're not, right? It's an impossibility, right? 
but from a practical point of view, uh, it does feel that you know somehow we're we're revealing something that isn't there before. So one metaphor, of course, is we're the, the mirror is always there, never been stained uh, fundamentally, but there's some dust on it. So uh, the quality of the mirror to reflect has never changed, and we don't want to change that. But still, uh, you know, we're, we're we're trying to keep the surface of the mirror clean. So this is the mirror, and then the glass, right? So we, we still want to keep um, the glass kind of clean, even though the mirror itself has never become uh, non-reflective. Like that. So we do want mirror-like awareness. So. Uh, we can't really become something we're not, you know? Uh, and so, uh, even Mahamudra and Dzogchen actually do follow like uh, Madhyamaka style that uh, really something can't come from nothing and something can't dissolve into nothing. Not, not the nothingness of emptiness, but that you can't become something you're not. But, so there's a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, discussion that because it does feel psychologically we could become something we're not. We could have that delusion. You know. Feels that way though, sometimes. We feel like, well, we've become an adult where we never believed we could as a kid, right? What do you think, Dirk? So, I, I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I don't feel like I've become something I wasn't when I was a child. I mean, in a sense, I have. In another sense, there's really no change at all. It's, it's like, so I'm not saying that it's the same person, but it's also not a different person. So that's why I think, like, both in Zen and Tantra, um, generally, um, one's asked to uh, express one's uh, realization in, in poetry or ironic language, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have that kind of uh, called twilight language in Tantra. So, uh, by, you know, uh, Kind of using uh, uh, when uh, when reading Sartre, for example, very interested to uh, find out the limits of language, right? Um, and uh, one of the important pieces uh, that uh, I think shares with Madhyamika thinking, the existentialist, is uh, language by necessity must be false. Okay, so because uh, if it was an exact correspondence, it would be not useful. Language has to be an abstraction. Uh, it'd be like kind of, um, I'm not sure whether Alice in Wonderland or, or Through the Looking Glass, where um, I think Alice asks for a map and is given the, the view of the territory, the same thing. You know, it just looks like a match. So you need a map to see the territory. That's the map territory. You know, see what I'm saying? So a map by necessity, a path has to be somewhat abstract because it's it's pulling, um, you know, uh, some things uh, forward and putting some things in the background to create contrast. So language by itself has to have a falsity or, or an imaginative quality about it. Um, and uh, we find this a lot in Yogacara and in Madhyamaka, like our critical language theory, um, whereas um, it, and it criticizes Abhidharma for being a literalist, a naive realist approach. Like we could just, the name of it would, you know, the word wet would also be wet, like that. <laughs> so that's why, I like, uh, working with teachers and Eventually, you're asked to express things somewhat poetically like that, meaning you recognize the imaginative and uh, healing fiction of, of language like that. Yeah.
I know. No, are we, are we gone too, no. too weird? Okay. No. Anyway, we're out. Yeah. So we're, we're out of time here anyway. So we can know. That was, those, uh, those are... <laughs> that's, that's intense because yeah. I think the more we communicate in higher levels of <clears throat> intelligence, perhaps mm -hmm. in telepathic communication mm -hmm. is not about words, right? It's mm -hmm. about context, feeling, and emotion. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where I went. That's uh, was fascinating. So thank you for sharing everything okay. today yeah. sure. uh, with all of us, of course. Yeah. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming. It's so nice to see everybody in person and online, of course, um, where I usually am. Donations, please. Lions for Dharma Center. As a board member, I can ask for oh, help, thank please. You. Yes, so that's, so uh, that's really yeah. important. This week we have on the calendar Amitayu's practice tomorrow at 7. Yeah. We have two Medicine Buddha sessions going every Friday, noon and 7, 30s at noon and 7 on Friday. And of course, introduction to meditation Tuesday night. So um, hope to see. Yes, Sue, yes, Sue sorry. Just while you're announcing those, Greg, yes. um, there is a, I'd like to invite everybody to the Wednesday night uh, meditation where we share and help each other. And it, it's wonderful to be here in the temple. So if you're f fully vaccinated and bring your mask, we'd love to have you here. It's, it's a real good motivator, I think, to, to have that energy together from 6 to 7.30 on Wednesday. Yeah, I just wanted to be I sure people I didn't come at the wrong no, day. I, my, I knew it was Wednesday, not Tuesday. My apologies. Any other announcements or anything? No? Okay. All right. Let's do. Uh, I'll say a little bit. Yeah, uh, sure. Just, Please. Uh, um, I'm sure everybody here uh, reads the weekly roar with dedication. Yeah. But um, um, Kenshin Ribshe is uh, coming back uh, first Sunday in October. Um, what's that? This October 4th or 3rd? October 3rd. Um, to. Uh, We'll go over the Amitayas uh, practice again. Um, so it's great. You know? <laughs> One, he's like nice. Two, he knows it. Uh, three, he's willing to share it, right? All those qualities uh, come together. Um, uh, this is uh, a highest yoga tantra practice that at the same time is extremely concise and um, detailed. Um, uh, a few people in the room are familiar with like Vajrayogini practice, right? Quite detailed, right? You know, you're not gonna, you know, so that uh, this practice uh, stays very deep and uh, he's willing to go into the details of the ritual and the meaning and, um, you know, just uh, being randoms. Uh, really nice. So I hope people can now make it. Yeah. And thank you for all people's donations over the whole year. We've managed to keep the lights on. And uh, that's been good news, right? Okay, let's go. All right. And all right, here we go with dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Tenzinyatsu, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Songkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losongdrapa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you again, everybody.